Okay, welcome back. Um, our teaching today is called The Last Days. And we're getting close to the end of my little series uh, on the restoration of all things. And like I always said, I'm not um, here to go over every single book in the Bible or every single chapter and verse. <clears throat> um, I don't think that's my gift to uh, go that deep into the Word of God. But I just wanted to clarify to those who are just starting to read the Bible, maybe for the first time, and then don't, uh, don't understand why the Bible is laid out the way it's laid out, and what God's intention for the whole, for everything He has put in the Bible, and that intention was to restore everything that we lost in the garden that Adam and Eve lost. He, they lost their relationship with God, and that's what God is restoring. And man has tried to bring this back by offering God a religion. And I've all said over and over again in many teachings that men's religion is just uh, trying to be as good as you can, trying to decide what you're going to do for God, and hopefully the good things you decide to do for God will get you into heaven. And that's not a relationship. A relationship is where you actually have a true communication with the living God who speaks back to you and you hear his voice and he tells you what pleases him he gives you instructions of everyday life of the things that are pleasing to him the things that aren't pleasing to him he tells you and you give up the things that are pleasing to him you do them you you, you obey his commands you obey his voice when he speaks in a religion in in pagan religion and Christians religions mostly most of Christian religion is they don't have no clue what God wants from them except of course the Ten Commandments you know don't kill don't steal don't commit adultery honor your father and mother so they follow those but they don't have any day-to-day -day relationship and communication with a living God who speaks to them and tells them specifically what he wants from their life that pleases him and they, they carry it out that's a true relationship uh, but man offers God religion that's what Adam and Eve had in the garden, a true relationship. Adam heard the voice of God, what he wanted him to do and not do. But he disobeyed and we lost that. Jesus came to restore it. God slowly restored it in the Old Testament. like a, It was just a prototype, a shadow of what Jesus was coming to truly restore in us. Okay, so we talked last, teaching was on the temple restored. And I compared the old Ezra and Nehemiah, the Old Testament, to the New Testament. And how God has finally restored, brought the true church back to what it was supposed to be, or what it started out to be in the book of Acts. That was the true church of God in the book of Acts. And it slowly fell away into around 300, 315 BC, I mean uh, AD, after the death of Christ. Uh, around 315, the church became, became a mixture of paganism and Christianity, or Babylon. And where pagan uh, idolatry and pagan customs got mixed in with Christianity. And that's what, that's where the temple was. Um, uh, I'm going to read in Second Chronicles. It uh, corrupted the temple, the true temple of God. When, bring, when you bring in pagan beliefs, pagan idolatry into Christianity, you corrupt God's true temple. That's what they did in the Old Testament by doing this. And when Constantine legalized Christianity, paganism slowly got adapted into Christianity. And so God has restored, and so in the days we're living now, God has restored His true church back to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the fivefold ministries of prophet, apostle, pastor, teacher, and evangelist. Okay, and so that's all restored now. And Today's teaching is called The Last Days. So, after Nehemiah and Esther, we go into, I mean, Nehemiah and Ezra, we go into Esther and Job in the Old Testament. I'm not going to go there. Psalms and Proverbs, we covered that already a little bit. We get into Ecclesiastes. But starting in Isaiah, we have 16 prophets, okay, that finishes off the Old Testament. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Sixteen prophets. I am not going to go into these books, okay? 
that's something you can do but they are there for one reason well two reasons one was to prophesy of the coming Messiah Jesus Christ and the book of Isaiah has more prophecies of the coming of Jesus than any of the other books and Jesus quoted Isaiah I think more than any other of the Old Testament prophets so Isaiah a prophesied of Jesus a lot in Isaiah and if you can read only one of the old prophets read Isaiah okay and they all if you want to go I'm gonna say what all these prophets were doing they were trying to return God's people return their heart back to God they had backslidden into the world of falling after the things that the pagans were falling after the love of this world the things of this world and even worshiping their pagan idols and worshiping God in the same customs the way the pagans worshiped and Moses warned against it way back when in the beginning uh, and all the prophets were doing one basic thing prophesying of the coming Messiah and telling God's people to return to the true worship and purity of worship to God alone and I read this in 2nd Chronicles 36 last week or two weeks ago but I want to read it again just to clarify what all the prophets were sent to do in verse 14 2nd Chronicles 36 all the important people of the nation including all the high priests worship the heathen idols of all the nations around them thus they polluted the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem Jehovah God of their fathers sent his prophets again and again to warn them for he had compassion on his people and on his temple but the people mocked their, these messengers of God and despised their words scoffing at the prophets until the anger of the Lord could no longer be restrained and there was no longer any remedy okay so that's what the prophets were sent to do tell God's people to return from their idol worship to the one true living God and they continued to mock them and kill the prophets and they even killed Jesus Christ God's whole God's people did all this all right all right and then in the New Testament we have the Apostles we have the 12 Apostles of course and we have all the epistles there are 21 epistles or letters written to the churches so we have the 16 prophets of the Old Testament 12 prophets of the Old Testament 12 apostles of the New Testament and we have 21 epistles and these were letters of, written to the churches for basically uh, three different reasons one, one like the book of Hebrews for instance was mostly a warning to the Jews who had been converted to Christianity not to go back to Judaism not to go back to the old way of priesthood offering sacrifices and warning the pagans who had come to Christianity not to go back to their worship of their idols they used to worship and also part of what they were doing was correcting the new church in errors they were making and encouraging them to continue in their faithfulness and their love for Christ not to uh, let their love dwindle down and we read those scriptures in Revelation so I want to read that in Revelation I read that last time because John wrote Revelation and John was one of the twelve apostles okay there's Peter wrote first and second Peter there's the book of James the book of Jude these are all apostles Paul wrote most of the epistles he was one of the apostles who took the place of uh, Judas who betrayed the Lord and Revelation 2 this is one of the warnings that John gave the church the churches okay he says, and this was John telling the church what Jesus told him to tell him. He or Jesus says to you, I know how many good things you are doing. I have watched your hard work and your patience. I know you don't tolerate sin among your members. Yet, in verse 4, there is one thing wrong. You don't love me at the first. Or in the King James, I'm reading out of the Living Bible. The King James Version says, you've left your first love. Here it says, yet there's one thing wrong, you don't love me as, for, as at the first or the, as at the beginning. Think about those times of your first love, how different now, and turn back to me again and work as you did before, or else I will come and remove your candlestick from its place among the churches. 
and also in chapter 3, Revelation, verse 15. I know you well, Jesus said. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were of one or the other. But since you are merely lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. And then it says in verse 18, uh, or 19, I continually discipline and punish everyone I love. So I must punish you unless you turn from your indifference and become enthusiastic about the things of God. Look, I have been standing at the door and I am constantly knocking. If anyone hears me calling him and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him and he with me. So these were warnings to the churches. The apostles, like the uh, prophets of old, the apostles were warning the churches, don't get lukewarm on, on Christ. Uh, you know, don't leave your first love of Jesus and mix in the love of this world and, and pagan idolatry with it. Okay, so the apostles were doing the same. So you can read all the epistles. I'm not going to go into any more of the epistles that I've already gone into. We have covered through the 40 teachings. This will be number 40. Uh, we've gone into the epistles off and on as we covered the, uh, the series. So I'm not going to take a whole book of the Bible or a whole epistle and go through it chapter by chapter. But if you do that, you'll see that's what these apostles were doing. Keeping the church fervent for the Lord, correcting their mistakes, keeping them from going back into the, their pagan ways or back into the Hebrew customs. So that's why they were all there and encouraging them. And one thing they were also um, talking about was that Jesus Christ was coming again. There's going to be an end of the world, and He's coming again. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. So first of all, even in the Old Testament, Jesus warned of His first coming. I mean, the uh, prophets told of His first coming, and the prophets told of His second coming. So I'm going to go to the book of Malachi, which is the last prophet of the Old Testament. And after this, Jesus quit talking through the people of Israel, through His prophets, 400 years until Jesus came because they weren't listening so he quit talking to them and chapter 3 of Malachi verse 1 says listen I will send my messenger before me to prepare the way and then the one you are looking for will come suddenly to his temple this is talking about the first coming of Jesus so Malachi 3 spoke prophes prophesied of the first coming of, of the Lord which was when he would come 400 years later. He said, I'm sending my messenger before he comes, which was John the Baptist. And uh, he will come to his temple. Yes, he is surely coming, says the Lord Almighty. But who can live when he appears? Who can endure his coming? For he is like a blazing fire, refining precious metal, and he can bleach the dirtiest garments. So Jesus came to purify us. He came to purge us of sin. The first time he came, was to purify us and purge his people of sin. He is like a blazing fire, refining precious metal, and he can bleach the dirtiest garments. Like a refiner of silver, he will sit and closely watch as the dross or impurities is burned away. And he will purify the Levites, the ministers of God, refining them like gold or silver, so that they will do their work for God with pure hearts. So we are all ministers of God. We are all priests of God. And he came the first time to do away with sin in our life. He came to shed his blood on the cross to put an end that the power of sin had over us. Okay, In the Old Testament all they could do was confess their sins and offer God animal sacrifices. And it would not purge them from sin. It couldn't. It didn't have power, the blood of animals, to set them free, purge them from the power of it. Just to forgive them for a time until Christ came. But Christ came, his first coming, was to put away sin out of our life. His blood is powerful enough not just to forgive us of sin. In 1 John 1, read that. He says, if we confess our sins, repent, not just confess them to say we're sorry, but if we turn and repent from them, His blood is powerful enough to forgive us, but also to set us free from its power once and for all. That's His first coming. The second coming is chapter 4 of Malachi. Verse 1, Watch now, the Lord Almighty declares, The day of judgment is coming, burning like a furnace. The proud and the wicked will be burned up like straw. Like a tree they will be consumed, roots and all. 
But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And you will go free, leaping with joy like calves led out to pasture. Then you will tread upon the wicked as ashes under your feet, says the Lord God Almighty. So, this is the second coming. When he comes again, it will be by far the first time he destroyed earth was by flood. Noah, we covered that. The second time, the second coming is going to be destroying the earth by fire. It's going to be a, a burning, like a burning furnace. Okay, he dealt with sin the first time. The second time he's coming, he's going to be dealing with all evil and all those who have not allowed him to set them free. All those who are still holding on to their sins and just caught up in religion, no matter what kind it is, and just loving the things of this world. He is coming to put an end to, you know, destroy all those who are not living for Him. Okay, that is prophesied in the Old Testament of His second coming. Now, in the New Testament, one of the best books that talk about His second coming, I believe, is Second Peter, and in chapter three. So, if you want to go to Second Peter, chapter three. We're going to read about his second coming in, that Peter talks about. Okay, and in verse 3, Peter says, First, I want to remind you that in the last days, and that's what my title is, last days, there will come scoffers who will do everything, every wrong they can think of and laugh at the truth. This will be their line of argument. So, Jesus promised to come, did he? Come back, did he? Then where is he? He'll never come. Why, as far back as anyone can remember, everything has remained exactly as it was since the first day of creation. They deliberately forget this fact, that God did destroy the world with a mighty flood, long after he had made the heavens by the word of his commandment, and had used the waters to form the earth and surround it. And God has commanded that the earth and the heavens be stored away for a great bonfire at the judgment day, the last day, when all ungodly men shall perish. So he said, these mockers say, the Lord won't come back like he said. The earth has always been the same since creation. But they forget about the flood that destroyed the earth in the first judgment. And on the second judgment, it will be like a great bonfire. But don't forget this, that dear friends, that a day or a thousand years from now is like tomorrow to the Lord. He isn't really being slow about His promised return, even though it sometimes seems that way. But He is waiting for the good reason that He is not willing that any should perish. And He has given more time for sinners to repent. He's given us more time to turn and repent and let us be purged from all of our ungodliness. The day of the Lord is surely coming as unexpectedly as a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the heavenly bodies will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be burned up. And so since everything around us is going to melt away, what holy and godly lives should we be living? You should look forward to that day and hurry it along, the day when God will set the heavens on fire, and the heavenly bodies will melt and disappear in flames. But we are looking forward to God's promise of a new heaven and a new earth afterwards, there, where there will be only goodness, only holiness. Dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen and for Him to come, try hard to live without sinning and be at peace with everyone so that He will be pleased with you when He returns. And remember why he is waiting. He has given us time to get this message of salvation out to others. Okay. So, these are the two, uh, one of the Old Testament, Malachi, the prophet, the last prophet, who spoke of the second return of Jesus, and the book of Second Peter, chapter 3. Peter's speaking of the return, of the second return of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, we're going to go into the book of Revelation, and I'm not going to, definitely not going to cover every chapter in the book of Revelation, and I'm not going to claim to be a Bible scholar on the book of Revelation, I'm just going to give you my thoughts on it, uh, 
uh, only what I believe the Lord has put in my heart about it. But if you go to Revelation, we've, we've read Revelation 2 and 3 already, a lot of that, uh, about God, Jesus, Jesus warning John to warn the churches to turn from their idolatry and their lukewarmness, or he would take away his anointing from their churches. But if you go to um, Revelation 12, okay, um, I'm not going to cover all this in one teaching. Uh, I'll divide it into two. But, and I think it's in Revelation 8, if I'm not mistaken. You know, when it talks about the great bonfire, the last end of the world will be by fire, the first was by flood. And I know uh, many teachings I've heard believe that this fire it's talking about is a nuclear war, you know, that there will be great nuclear devastation. Uh, Matthew 24, we talked a little bit about that when they asked Jesus what it would be like in the last days. Uh, we, we went into that once already in one of the teachings. He talked about there will be famine, there will be wars, uh, there will be pestilence. So all that's going to happen. There's going to be great diseases that can't be cured. There will be famine, earthquakes, he said, which is all happening now. It's always happened. But they will intensify. And he talked about wars will also intensify. And, and some believe that this fire has to do with a nuclear war. And, and I'm not... Um, Disputing that at all, I believe it's in Revelation. I had written it down, but I think in Revelation chapter eight, you can go there, and it talks about. Um, I had it in my notes, but I'm pretty sure it's in Revelation eight. It, it talks about um, this. Uh, he saw stars falling from heaven onto the earth, and one third of the trees were burned up. He says in Revelation eight, one third of the grass was burned up. Uh, and the star fell into the waters, and one third one third of the seas could not be the waters in the uh, sea could not be drank because of the bitterness, and that the had a cloud of darkness that covered the earth, covered the sun and the moon. So this sounds like a nuclear fallout that would even darken the skies, and that that would burn up the trees and the grass, and the water couldn't be drank because of the nuclear fallout. So it sounds like that, right? Um, so I'm not disputing that, but I think more than anything um, that this fire will be God's fiery trial in our life. I mean, this last three and a half years, that will be the greatest persecution against Christians before Christ comes. will be the greatest turmoil on earth. In Matthew 24, Jesus told the disciples that this would be the greatest turmoil that the earth has ever seen. So this great turmoil will put every Christian to the test, and that's a fiery test. Peter also talks about, don't think it's strange about the fiery test God's going to send everyone. So whoever has not gone through a fiery test in their life, this last three and a half years on earth will be the greatest fiery test. I believe that has more to do with the fire that's going to destroy everything than anything else. Uh, and he will put all... Uh, people who call themselves Christian, professing Christians. All professing Christians will be put to the test. If they truly are trusting Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the, the relationship that he, they have in communication with Him, are they trusting that? Are they trusting His voice that will tell them how to, what to do in those last three and a half years? Or are they trusting in their religion, their church, which, did, which has nothing to do with communicating with God at all? Um, and then they will, if they're not trusting in the Jesus Christ and His a communication with Him through a born again experience, then they will fall into this trap of the last three and a half years. And so that's why I want to read ch chapter twelve and thirteen. In twelve one says, "I saw a great pageant." Now this is in the Living Bible. Then a great pageant appeared in heaven, portraying things to come. And I saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. And she was pregnant and screamed in pain of her labor, awaiting to be delivered. Now this is not talking about Mary, this woman in heaven. It's talking about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's portrayed as a woman. Okay, his bride. We are His bride, the church. This woman is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the true church, not any denomination. Those who hear His voice, who had a born-again experience, filled with the Holy Ghost, hear His voice, follow Him day to day. That's His true church. Go and do His works that He's 
told them, he, he, he explains to them what he wants them to do in the earth. That's his true church. It's not Mary, this woman they're talking about. Suddenly a red dragon, who is the devil, appeared with seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns on his head. I'm not going to try to explain all that because I don't fully understand it myself. He stood before the woman as she was about to give birth to her child, ready to eat the baby as soon as it was born. She gave birth to a boy, or a man-child, it says. A man-child means an overcomer, who was to rule all nations with a heavy hand, and he was caught up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness, where God prepared for her a place to take care of her for 1260 days. See, that's the three and a half years. Every Bible uh, in time prophecy talks about the last three and a half years, and that's where they get it from. It also in the Old Testament, too. Uh, I'm not sure what book. I think maybe Daniel, but I'm not sure. But there's also, also a book in the Old Testament that talks about these three and a half years. So this man-child was born. Yes, it's Jesus was born a man-child, an overcomer. But it's talking about those that are birthed out of his true church who have uh, listened to the teachings, followed the instructions, followed the voice of the Lord, and they overcame. You know, in Revelation 2 and 3, to all seven churches. Okay, in Revelation 2 and 3, John wrote a letter instructed by Jesus to all the seven known churches at that time, telling them to turn from their different things they were getting into. And he said to every one of the churches, he said there are going to be overcomers in each one of those churches, but not every one of those churches were going to overcome everything. But to everyone in those churches that did overcome, he had a promise that he would reward them okay if you want to read that everyone had a pro every one of those seven churches he said to those who overcome in this church i have a reward for you okay different rewards so this is this man child that was birthed out of the church those who overcame out of the church those who didn't follow the church into idolatry and into love of loving the things of this world that the churches are going into they overcame that and they stood faithful to jesus christ that's this man child <clears throat> okay and then there was war in heaven Michael and his angels fought against the devil and his angels and then 10 I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens it has happened at last God's salvation and the power and the rule and the authority of his Christ are finally here for the accuser of our brother has been thrown down on earth He accu who accused them night and day before God and they overcame him, or it says here, they defeated him, or God's overcoming people, defeated Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they did not love their lives, even unto death. Rejoice, O heavens, you citizens of heaven, rejoice, be glad. But woe to you, people of the earth, for the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing that he has a little time left because his end is almost here where Jesus will lock him up. So when the devil, when the devil or dragon found himself cast down to earth, he persecuted the woman who had given birth to the child, but she was given two wings like a great eagle to fly away into the wilderness. Okay, at a place prepared for her where it says three and a half years. All right. Now 13. And now, in my vision, I saw a strange creature rising up out of the sea. It had seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns upon its horns. And written on each head were blasphemous names, each one defying and insulting God. Okay, so first there's a beast, in the, in the King James says beast. There's a beast that comes out of the sea. Verse 1. Now if you go to... Uh, let's see. Now the dragon, or the devil, encouraged this beast to speak against great blasphemies against the Lord. So the devil encouraged this first beast that came out of the sea to speak blasphemous things against the Lord. And he gave him authority to control the earth for 42 months. And the dragon devil gave him power to fight against God's people and to overcome them and to rule over all nations and languages throughout the world and all mankind whose name were not written down in the Lamb's book of life will worship this beast 
That's the first beast. Okay. Verse 11. Then I saw another beast. This one coming out of the earth. With two little horns like those of a lamb. But with a fearsome voice like a dragon. Or he spoke like a, a devil. He exercised all the authority of the first beast. Okay. Then go down to... 13 he did unbelievable miracle unbelievable miracles such as making fire come down to earth from the skies while everyone was watching by doing these miracles he was deceiving people everywhere he could do these marvelous things whenever the first beast was there to watch him and he ordered the people of the world to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and had come back to life he was permitted to give breath to this statue and even make it speak then the statue ordered that anyone refusing to worship it must die. He required everyone, great and small, rich and poor, slave and free, to be tattooed with a certain mark on their right hand or their forehead. And no one could get a job or even buy any in any store without the permit of that mark, which was either the name of the creature or the code number of his name. Here is a puzzle that calls for careful thought to solve it. Let those who are able to interpret this code and the numerical value of the letters in his name add up to 666. Now, I'm not going to get into that, okay? So I, I honestly don't think it's going to be an actual tattoo on your head or your hand. It's going to be more subtle than that so that people are going to be swallowed up in this. But Okay, in these last days, this beast that comes out of the earth and the beast that comes out of the sea, their power will be given to them by Satan himself to work miracles. And everyone will be deceived, thinking that this must be God. This must be uh, God's, God's anointed ones. But this beast that comes out of the sea is speaking of religion. Waters always speak of God's people. Okay, the, the great whore in Revelation 17 sits on many waters. This Babylon sits on many waters, meaning she sits on people. So waters, sea, have to do with religion. The beast that comes out of the earth are those the kings of the earth. I'm going to read that later. So the beast that comes out of the sea will be a religious leader. The beast that comes out of the earth will be a political or king of the earth, political leader. And they will unite together. To make one world government and one world religion. This will be the end time one world antichrist. Okay. You, you've heard of that in many books. and many. I'm sure you have to have heard of it. It's, it's even have uh, books written on it. TV, TV movies you know, on it. Most of them is just Hollywood version of it. And, you, and I don't claim to know exactly the full extent of it. But I believe that when it talks about this beast of the sea. Beast of the earth. It's actually speaking of the kings. Political leaders coming into one world government and all religions coming into one world religion and uniting and they will unite against the Lord's true anointed spirit filled born again people because the Lord's true anointed born again people will not be swallowed up by these miracles they can know that this is these two characters are given power by the devil to deceive the whole world and those who will not follow or worship them the way they want them to be worshipped, the way, the way they want to be worshipped, they will be killed, and they will also not be allowed to buy or anything, or, or get a job, okay? So I don't know how that's going to happen, or in what way, but it's going to happen that uh, <clears throat> the overcomers, even in the very last three and a half years, they have to overcome this deception. Now, <clears throat> it's very possible uh, in some place, I think in the Old Testament, it talks about seven years, and so some Bible teachers believe there are seven last years instead of three and a half, which could be that the first three and a half might be nuclear war, which would, can you imagine if there'd be a worldwide nuclear war, this would want to bring the whole world into one world government and peace and one world religion. And so, you know, the whole world would be hungry for peace by then, That after all that catastrophe. But, and then when these false antichrists come up, this false religious leader and false political leader unite, the world is going to think, Christians, in long, Christians included, professing Christians who don't have a true relationship, along with all the other pagans, uh, 
will believe, well, you know, this first three and a half years must have been the nuclear war, what the Bible was talking about, and now this Antichrist is the true Christ. But it's not, because this three and a half years following will be the false Christ, the false anointed ones, uh, given power by Satan, religion and politics coming together on the one unit, which is Babylon. And economically too, they will not let anyone buy or sell without their mark, without their worship the way they want. And so the last persecution of Christ, true Christians will come at this time, and those who are only professed Christians will fall under the, will fall and be gullible and be swallowed up by this deceiving antichrist, and believe that this is the true Christ that's come to bring peace. And they will bring, they will bring peace for three and a half years. But it'll be a false peace because it will not be the true Christ. Okay, so why do I believe that? I'm gonna end up with this message today. First, go to Psalms, and I've read this once before. In Psalms chapter two, and then we'll go to Acts chapter four. Let me see where the Acts, yeah, Acts chapter four. Okay, and I'm gonna read this in the King James version. Psalms chapter 2. Why do I believe this beast of the sea is religion, a religious leader and the beast of the earth is a political leader? Psalm, because history always repeats itself. Okay. Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? For the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together, meaning the religious rulers, because is going to repeat that in Acts 4, and he's talking about the Jewish the Jewish religious leaders who came together with Pontius Pilate to kill Jesus. So the kings of the earth and the rulers, religious rulers, take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed ones, saying, Let us break their bands asunder, and let us cast away their cords from us. But he that sits in the heavens will laugh at them, and the Lord will have them in confusion. Okay, now go to Acts. This was this what happened. The, David wrote Psalms. David prophesied this would happen in Psalms. So in Acts, in chapter 4, it happened to Jesus. Okay, so here in Acts chapter 4, uh, Peter and John healed someone and they all came to listen to them preach. And so he was preaching to them. In verse 25, Acts chapter 4, Peter says, Who by the mouth of your servant David has said, repeating Psalms, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For a truth against your holy child Jesus, whom you have anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles, Herod and Pontius Pilate was political leaders, and the people of Israel, religious leaders, gathered together to do whatever your hand and your counsel had determined beforehand to be done. Okay, so he's, he repeated it here, he's preaching to the people about how both Herod, political authority, and the religious leaders of the Jews came together and took counsel together to, to destroy Jesus. So it happened to Jesus Christ in Acts. David prophesied it in Psalms. And I believe it's going to happen again in the last three and a half years. So I believe that's why this beast that comes out of the sea and the beast that comes out of the earth are religious and political leaders that you can unite the world into one religion and one world government. And work miracles in the sight of the people so that everybody believes they're the true Christ, the anointed ones sent to bring peace, but they're going to be deceiving people, and most people will fall for it except the true people who hear God's voice and only follow His voice. So, um, that's all I'm going to cover today. We're going to get into a little bit more revelation, and I think uh, the next teaching may very well be the last one in this series. And I'm going to call it, I believe, All Things New, where when he comes, he's going to make all things new again, heaven and earth, a new heaven and a new earth, when all this is over with, when this last three and a half years. And I believe this end is coming soon. 
God keeps warning me year after year. Now it's even warning me month after month about, you know, uh, be awake, stay awake. It's coming. Don't fall asleep now. So it's getting close. I really do believe that. So uh, stick around.